Switzerland and Ireland, these sounds like they sound like countries for retirement. Peter Sellers hasn't retired, has he? Oh, good God, no, no. No, no, no. Uh, Ireland, really, was a place... See, I had to get out of England, right? Now, we were thinking of going to Wishley, because I like it. There's a lot of things happening there. I like the people, you know, they don't give a damn about this, and, you know, mm. they're easy to get on with. And I always like the Italians, especially I like living just outside, excuse me. I beg your pardon. Good Lord. That was my wife's sister. She would be most annoyed. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I beg your pardon. Again. Three times to the power of three. <laughs> just a moment. Allow me to, um, panning down as <laughs> faces carefully the... Artificial plastic moss by the side of the... There we are. <coughs> yes, where were we? Yes. Um, I'm not nervous, you know. <laughs> I'm not used to this sort of thing. <coughs> yes. Yes, we're... <laughs> you obviously haven't retired, then. No, yeah. I'm thinking of it. <laughs> <laughs> no. What are you involved in at the moment? Are you filming? M moving. Actually, moving from uh, here... We've been here for about a year, apart from three months that I spent in California. Um, and then, uh, so I'm going back to, uh, to England. Then I'm so going to make a couple of films, one there, then one in Guernsey, another one back in England. And then, uh, I don't know, there's some interesting things happening, you know, whizzing around all over the place. The great thing about this business, being an actor, is that you know, you lead the life of a gypsy. You, you don't have to stay in any one place too long. Does this suit you? Yeah, it, it, very much, yes. You know, I've been brought up with it. It's been, you know, I come from a theatrical family. I've been sort of touring around all my life. I like roots. Every actor, of course, naturally, every person likes roots, especially actors, because usually they live, you know, out of, in dressing rooms and out of old, well, in digs and, 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 and skips, baskets, you know. Um, so to have roots is a big thing, uh, but I, I mean at the same time you mustn't let them be sort of hang around your neck. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well apart from one short period in telly, you've avoided the box quite a lot. Mm. Why? Why? Because um, I think that the box is only just beginning to sort itself out. Uh, in the early days when we did Fred, son of Fred, idiot, weekly price tuppence. We were breaking new ground, which incidentally, you know, is still being broken, as they say, by people who were our fans then. Um, but I haven't yet found, strangely enough, the other day I was offered a comedy series in America. The first two looked very good, but I think one would have to be sure that the whole 26 were really good. The awful to two, two good ones and then, you know, uh, a whole load of really crappy ones, you know, it would be awful. And you see that so often, don't you, mm. you know. Um, so, um, I don't know. I don't mind doing the odd thing, the odd show. I did one laugh in, you know, a bit of joke on that and the arty and things. Uh, I've done odd talks and um, a few interviews like this. In the main, though, it's very difficult. And especially in America, because they're very tough in television. You know, they really are. They're very dictatorial. You, you were saying that many modern television comedy series owe quite a bit to the ground you were breaking some years ago. Do you think this is true? Do you think they owe a lot to your work in television? Yes, I think well, they would be the, the first to admit it, too. You know, I mean, for example, Monty Python. Uh, not particularly the format, but the style of the humour within that. Um, and we used to have shows like Son of Fred. Um, we'd have sketches, for example, and although you can create the parallel between the two, you could say, okay, that's not deriv it is derivative in one way, but it's certainly not, you know, a straight copy. Although all humour, you know, it, I mean, there are no hardly any original jokes heard, I think, an original joke the other day about two Martians meeting. One said, well, what's your name? I don't know if this is original. It may not be. One said, my name, 7, 12, 19, 4, 8, 2, 6. And the other one said, that's strange, you don't look Jewish. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I've heard so many Martian jokes now. Yeah. But that 
seems to be new, and I don't know, maybe, but maybe if we look into some joke book somewhere, we'll find <laughs> something. So much for well, anti-Semitic well, jokes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But we, we got to know you, the British public got to know you through the goons and the the goon show n never seemed to really happen on television but it seems to me that Monty Python perhaps comes nearest to doing visually what you did in sound radio. Well Monty Python was never on radio you see. Mm. That's the thing because people in uh, when, they, when radio was at its height and when we were on radio for like nine years people built their own pictures of what we were like the characters we portrayed and made and they didn't want to see them they wanted to see what was in their minds, so it, we would shatter an illusion, you see. There was no illusion about Monty Python because they presented themselves. I think that's the difference, the origination. If you start with, say, John Cleese looks like John Cleese, um, no one knew what Major Bloodnut looked like. Okay, they knew what I looked like, Harry and Spike, but they didn't know what our characters, we used to take them on trips, looked like, you know. I think that's where the, the, the main the problem was. You know? How did the characters look to you? Um, how did you see them? Well, we once did a, a, a book of drawings. Uh, Spike did, uh, brought it around for some publisher who uh, wanted to have original drawings that we used to do on the back of scripts. I don't know. The blood knock, you see, came, out, came from our days in India. Spike was born in India and spent a long time in India, and I was in India during the war. So blood knock was everything that stood for the British Raj in India the worst uh, of the British Raj in India. He's still the one that survived. He's a very strong character, Blandon. A dreadful man, will stop at nothing. Anything, anything at all he will do for money. Must be for money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you see, he went, it doesn't matter, it's a knock on the door. <laughs> Don't come in, just in case. But you never know, there might be somebody. Uh, my dear, sit over there, it's my daughter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's that sort of, he's always worried in case he's caught out or something. Mm -hmm. Two people, we were thinking the other day, is, you know, we're going to do this 50th anniversary of the BBC, we're going to do one show. And we were wondering whether Henry Crun and Minnie, <laughs> Minnie, <laughs> Minnie Bannister had died by now. They're probably dead, you see. We wondered if they were dead. Spike said he thought they might be dead, uh, because they were very old then, so I mean, I don't know whether they could have <laughs> existed, you see. But Blood Knock, you see, would still be alive. Blue Bottle would be, you know, his voice would have broken now, <laughs> and more, more acne would have appeared, you see. There'd be a lot of acne now and spots. Well, what about my favourite character from the Goon shows, Eccles? I reckon old Eccles, um, probably in a loony bin somewhere by now. I don't know, we have to figure out, I think Eccles will be showing up, I'm pretty sure he will. Mm. And, uh, <clears throat> but it's interesting, because we've got to think about it. We've got to think about what's happened to these characters over the years, or will we be taking people straight back? In fact, what I think Spike wants to do is to present the Goon Show as it was at the Camden Hippodrome, but in new format with the same characters, as though we'd been running all the time. We were doing the show nowadays, you know, what we perhaps, if obviously new characters would have evolved by now, but I don't know who or what they would be. So we'll just have to sort of try and feel our way there, you know. Which was your favourite character from those days? Um, I used to like Henry and Minnie a lot. Moriarty and Gritpipe Thin were two of my favourites. Gritpipe, because he was the ultimate in con men, and this poor Moriarty, who, you know, used to drive in the old days on his uh, Hispano Suiza, and he was the, uh, you know, the ace French, uh, entrepreneur and um, confidence trickster and everything. And he answered an advertisement in the paper one day, wanted a French um, assistant to um, uh, uh, apply immediately, Honorable Hercules, good pipe thin, 14, the chamber, so and so. And so he answered this advertisement, and then he was sleek and young, you know, Moriarty. Ah, yes, ah. No one ever knew if Moriarty was French, Italian, German, Indo-Chinese, whatever. He said he'd pretend to be something else because he couldn't really speak any language, you see. <laughs> and then, of course, eventually, Grit Pipe Thin dominated Moriarty to such an extent that he became, I mean, you know, he was said like something that had crawled out of, um, poor creature that crawled out of Belson or somewhere like that because of lack of food. They used to live in dustbins, if you remember. He'd say, there was 
those kipper bones, Moriarty, there's plenty left in them yet, you know. <laughs> and you hear this voice or a hand come up over the edge of the table and Grip Pike would say, when you see it hitting, you go, <laughs> and, and this hand would disappear, you see. Because it was never, uh, those, he got into such a state by then, mm. Grip Pike had got Moriarty to such a state, he wasn't allowed at the table with him, anywhere. You see, after setting, setting out as equals, tell me about yourself, Count. It is Count Moriarty, isn't he? He said, yes, I am uh, Count Moriarty. Ah, uh, well, I remember I was first connected with the great espionage between, um, and they started like this, you see. And this is very interesting because I have lots of contacts and things, and um, you have some decorations. I have many decorations. I can yell like I have my own suit and everything. You see, so, and off they go. And they used to crash these do's, you see, where they would, we just happened to be passing duchess, and we were just, uh, food, free, ha, 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 you see, and silver, anything. You know. And then, of course, that, that was their background, you see, their own little private world they lived in. They'll be there, they'll be there. Those are reflections of people in everyday life, I think, most of our characters. I mean, for example, Blue Bottle. Blue Bottle was a reflection of a boy I knew once when I was at kindergarten, going back a long time now, I was seven years old, and I bought a model in lead of Malcolm Campbell's um, record-breaking car, the Bluebird, and it was the first of the models uh, even in those days, and it was expensive, where you could lift the body off and you could see all the engine in lead. Everything was in lead, of course. Uh, and the wheels, of course, weren't properly shaped. They were sort of pressed over at the end, you know, so they wouldn't come off. But nevertheless, it was a blue. And I, you know, this was my pride and joy. And I took it to school. And all the kids were around there, all looking at it, you know. And looking can I, can I near it and running it on desks and things. Mm. And a little spotty Herbert came up to me, and I never forgot it. And he came out of the crowd, you see, jockeying for power. This is what it was, you see. And he said to me, can I be the man that sees no one touches it for you? <laughs> now, I never forgot that, because he wanted to give himself, he, he'd go up, you see, he'd be a manager then. Now, stand back, because <laughs> I will tell you if you're allowed to touch that. You see? Yes, you can do that. <laughs> you see, he's then one up, now, and got nearer to it himself, so he could touch it whenever he wanted. Mm -hmm. But the others. So and I never, and that was the basic philosophy <laughs> behind Blue Bottle. Mm -hmm. See, he was a very simple young lad, you see. He used to make all his Roman outfits and things out of Kellogg's cut out conflict boxes, you know. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. All his swords were made of silver paper and mm -hmm. cardboard and, and all that. You know. But you, you knew Blue Bottle. Did, did you, in fact, know people who <laughs> epitomized the other characters for you? Well, I knew several majors that looked like Major Bloodnock, you know, Spike did too, and then we sort of based him loosely on all the bods we'd met in India and everything. Red Pipe Thin we based on George Sanders because we wanted that nice soft and you know, drawing so on. Moriarty came out of, I don't know where, he was, I don't know, I think he uh, was a French mountain ace who n sprang nimbly from crag to crag like a, like a goat. Pity about his death. I said, why, what happened? He said, fell down a manhole. Oh, you know, like what, goes hopping from mountain to mountain and then goes straight down a manhole. You know? mm, yeah. mm. Well, you continued your car interest in character acting, in fact, to consider yourself, I'm sure, a character actor into films. Mm. Uh, of all the characters you've played... Well, the caricatures, of course, those, yes. you know, but I mean, based on real life, mm -hmm. uh, on real life, I should say. Yeah. Of all the characters you've played, uh, which one has given you the most satisfaction? Um... It's difficult to say, that one. I mean, I, I don't really know. I suppose, in one way, that um, uh, I like playing um, the, uh, the Indian in, in the party. I, and I enjoyed that, uh, because it had, uh, we decided to use a format like Jacques Tati free format of improvisation, you know, just round a framework of an idea. That's Blake Edwards. That's just before he got caught up with Darling Lily, mm -hmm. which incidentally was filmed partly in this house over the back there, you know. Mm -hmm. And so the end of that film is not quite right. I mean, it sort of falls away, but there are three quarters of it. They're very, very, very good. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed that. I, I like playing the old trade union chap way back in um, I'm All Right Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, Recently, there's a film coming out, I, I made recently, uh, called um, 
Where does it hurt? There's a, fe there's a fellow called Albert T. Hofnagel. I enjoy playing him. He's an administrator in a hospital. Um, I don't know. I think I like most of them. And some I've really hated, you know, really, absolutely hated. Uh, I, 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 I don't know that I've got a, a particular favorite. Maybe it's Dr. Strangelove. You've, you've always made a big thing of the voice of your characters. Is this your way of getting into an individual? Do you, do you start with the voice? Yeah, well, I do, because I, I suppose because I started in radio. And acting with your voice, naturally, you have to portray the whole character. So I found that if I... If I um, you like to hot box. This is a sauna or an interview, it is. A sauna and an interview. Indeed, yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I like the saunas, you know. It's good to hot the hair. No, isn't what the hell it is. Really wearing too many clothes for a sauna, of course. I am, but it's uh, Ingmar Bergman. Yes, yes. <laughs> Ingmar Bergman. I like that. It's Ingmar Bergman. He hit film. The light in the camera in the clothing in the hood. <laughs> this sound in the fruit, the food, new, and half new. My ex-wife used to speak like that. I could never understand what she was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> this must have made it's for a... why we get divorced. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it must have made for a very interesting relationship. Yes, it did, yes. very. Take the food in here. You see things like that. <laughs> But your, your characters have all been so very, very different, and, and yet each one of them has been obviously very personally observed. Could they, per cha by any chance, have come not from the outside but from within? Are they all part of you? No, I don't think so, though it's arguable, of course. Um, I go around watching, observing people, which rather, you know, tends to make me bad company. But, you know, when one goes out socially poor, uh, to invite out, I mean, um, bad bet, ooh, well. But constantly, you see, invited, because by those who haven't experienced the dreadful you know, thing that happened at the party, we, he was sitting in the corner, and there was a thing all evening. Miss Strange. I thought it was a coon or something. Very odd. Never said a word. And I don't know what it was. He said something very strange to the woman he was sitting next to, the Countess of Bathan, I think it was. Anyway. And then things like that happen, you see, and one doesn't say anything. Because bod bods come up and say things to you, like, um, have you got, I mean, a proper job? I mean, apart from what, you know, this thing you do, this acting thing. I mean, a real job. Have you? Do you, in fact, find yourself a social outcast at parties? No, but uh, I think, for example, whereas an actor like Peter Ustinov is a natural raconteur at parties, uh, he's... He's very good anywhere, actually, as a conversationalist, generally. I tend more to sit back and watch other people. That's what's made me appear to, except when, among my own intimate friends, then obviously one opens up as, and we swap ideas and things. But uh, so consequently, Peter Ustinov, uh, one woman said to me, I have, I have heard that you are funnier than Peter Ustinov. She's a very famous French socialite. I said, who told you? She said, this man here told me. And I said, I did I, I first I've heard about it. He said, oh, "But you are funny. You have tell him, tell her, tell her a funny story. You're not a man." Oh, no, no. So I said, "I don't know any funny stories." And she said, oh, "I refuse to believe that." <laughs> you know, now, I mean, what are you going to do? You're standing there. I mean, I wouldn't think of going up to somebody and saying, "I hear you're a very good accountant." He'd say, "Yes, yeah, it's quite right. Yes." <laughs> so would you do me a, a column of figures? And oh, no, I couldn't really. No. no. Come on, please, a quick one. Oh well. <laughs> what? Um, I mean, you know, in running into a thousand, shall we say, or...? <laughs> I say, it's not for me, it's for my sister. She, she um, loves your figures. Oh, really? Yes, yeah, she collects all of them. She's seen all of your accounts. Oh! <laughs> what was your favourite account? Oh, I don't know, I had one, you know. I mean, you could take it <laughs> that sort of life. The thing to do, I think, to be prepared at these things... I had a great idea with one of the gadgets I've got, that if two people had this particular gadget, well... Uh, you could talk to each other at a cocktail party with a lot of rhubarb going on and uh, without being bored by all these other people. See, yes. this, is, this is one of them. Mm -hmm. this, is, um, this is actually um, a stereo uh, headset yes. and it works much better in America because they've got masses of stereo stations. Mm -hmm. but you, um, and it's in fact a radio. And you put it on, you listen, you know, switch on like this. And this other thing here, this is an FM... Mic. In other words, it's a radio mic, and um, and this is the uh, 
transmitting aerial, so to speak. And um, if you tune these into this, so like this, you can um, hear yourself speaking. Or the other person can, if they had a, a corresponding set. So you could keep up a marvellous conversation without listening to anybody. Anybody else, I mean, you know, if they came up and said, you know, <laughs> and, unless you sort of went like that. And then they think they were on the air and say, oh, <laughs> how do you do? <laughs> You know, they see where they get sort of stuck with cameras, you know. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, I, uh, I, I do, uh, uh, I have, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, those terrible things. But you don't, you don't practice being the party bore apart from that? No, I don't practice. Oh, God, no. Well, I like to enjoy myself, yeah. you know. Mm. But I, I get, I always, people, you know, come around and... It's natural, I mean, you're supposed to be a comic, supposed to be a humorist, supposed to be funny. And, you know, they like to hear something. But it happens. It's got to happen, you know. You can't go in the room and say, Well, here we are, folks. Hello. Ha, 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 Have you heard about the family who... So and so and so. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, and everyone will go... <laughs> no, I like to sort of drift in and mingle and see who's there and, you know. There's other people who come up to you, you know, who are dying to meet somebody to insult them, you see. There's that sort. It's like poor old Sean Connery. It always gets people, Hello. Who is it? coming up to him and going, Sean Connery, pow, you see, just because he's James Bond. It's because they've hit him. I hit James Bond. I hit him. I, t I really hit him. You know. He hasn't done a thing, not, not a word. He hasn't said anything. I, sorry, somebody on the phone. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. But I hear you've been um, practicing, actually, something that works quite without words, communicating visually. In the early days, well, uh, I can't do it here, I haven't got enough room. I do the... Um, what was it? The toast at the uh, the uh, the toast at the optician's ball, head optician at the convention. Uh, opticians of the world, it is my honour tonight uh, to be guest of honour. Honour tonight to be guest of honour. Yes, it would be. Yes. <laughs> and so, therefore, may I propose the toast? The toast is to the eyesight of the world and the future worlds. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> or they take up their glass and they go <laughs> like that, <laughs> you see. It depends which one you want to do. Fill up your glasses with sparkling wine. Or that one, you see, with another twist on the other one. Yes, that's a quite a good one there, isn't it? Mm. I'd never take too much of anything, you know, only for medicinal purposes. <laughs> it affects my eyes get drunk, you know. <laughs> what about your other interests, um, apart from your very busy life and your collection of gadgetry? Oh, uh, well, uh, hobbies are uh, photography, um, cars, uh, gadgets, uh, hi-fi, you know? Mm. What are you doing in photography? Well, I do... Uh, actually, I'll start to boast for a moment. I do layouts for magazines. Mm. Yes, box. No, I, uh, I, I. Sometimes I'm asked by Stern and and uh, Dead Telecom, Color Supplement, Times, Color Supplement, various magazines, to do things for them. Mainly because I once got a break. I've always been a keen photographer ever since you know for, for years. But I, I never took it up professionally. Only. Sort of fa fairly recently, I decided to see how I would fare in that world, you see. But not as me. This is the trouble. I had to beat that one because I didn't want to be photographed taking photographs. You know what I mean? Because yeah. they said, great, and then we can take a photograph of you taking a photograph. You see, I said, no, no. All I want is a credit in the corner, you see. Don't want that angle. You know, because that's anyone can do that. For, you know, film actor takes a photograph of. Miss Gloria Knees, you know, or something like that, you know, and uh, bless you. And um, so uh, that, that's, no, I, I had to get my work for accepted as a photographer because whether they liked the work or they didn't like the work, see, uh, on its own merit. So um, I eventually did, and um, it brings me in quite a nice, uh, you know, uh, living, but I mean, I don't sort of ever think of it that way, really, because I sort of, you know, spend mainly on equipment and stuff. 
But it's nice to know that one has got a sort of <coughs> second string, you know, so to speak. How has your work as a photographer been accepted? Uh, well, um, I'm shortly going to bring a book out of uh, photographs that have, you know, taken over the uh, years. And, um, and then I'm going to... Uh, uh, and there are some being exhibited in London at the moment at the ICA, Institute of Contemporary Arts in, in the Mall. And... Um, I think with some success. Well, what does the future hold for Peter Sellers? I don't just go on being an actor, doing my best in films, doing my best in the theatre, and, uh, and really, I suppose, the ultimate is to remain, at, and the most difficult thing, is to remain uh, being continually successful. Peter Sellers, thank you very much for having us to your home this afternoon. Thank you for talking to us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much.